let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about? and welcome back to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. If you've enjoyed our opening music, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring Maya Dore. You can download it on any of your favorite music platforms. For those of you that are new to Alzheimer Speaks, we're about sound information, not just sound bites. And our goal is to raise voices big and small, those diagnosed, those that care and serve them, advocates, researchers, and more. I also have to thank our audience. Uh, you guys are wonderful. Your likes, your clicks, your shares have spread our brand footprint. And for that, I really thank you. And I invite you to be a guest to tell your own story as well. Just reach out to me, Lori LeBay at alzheimerspeaks.com. Now, before I introduce our guest, Monica Hall, today, I always like to give a shout out to a couple of organizations. And I would like to remind people that the GAIN Alzheimer's trial is still open. And that is for people 55 to 80 years old with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease and who have a care partner or family member willing to um, attend study visits with them and help with paperwork and daily reports and uh, oversee the taking of medication. You can go to www.gaintrial.com forward slash en. And then I would also love to have you swing by coralhealth.com. They are, during this time of uh, COVID crisis, letting people download their Music First and Coral Faith apps for free. Last, I just want to mention the Memory Cafe directory. You can go to Memory Cafe directory and find uh, a, one of like 900 groups uh, that are available to you. Now, some of those are not active right now during COVID, uh, but there are many that are still doing virtual cafes and you, you can go to any of the virtual cafes. So with no further ado, let me go ahead and introduce you to our guest. Well, I am really excited to have this conversation and to introduce you to Monica Hall. She has um, walked for three years the journey with her dad, who suffered from Alzheimer's disease and was in a memory care unit. She recently wrote a book entitled Hoof, which I love that title because I think, I think it just sums things up sometimes on how we feel, which is a true story about love, life, and Alzheimer's. And you will be able to purchase the book now, and but we'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. So I, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. I, I like I said, I love the title of your book. How did I got to ask you? How did you pick the title? Well, I decided, and there's a little story about it in my book. Um, I thought about it, and there's we're all kind of like dandelions. We start out yellow or a little closed, but then we blossom into a yellow and we're vibrant. And yellow is kind of like the sign of youth and everything. Then as we age, we, the color kind of fades and then it's a white blow ball and wisps carry off like poof. And bits and pieces, just like an Alzheimer's mind, seem to drift away and you can almost see the new levels um, when 
different happenings occur and um, pieces just escape um, more and more until poof, they're gone. And that's pretty much the basis for that. You know, when I when I went to your website and it has the video of, of you know, you can actually see the dandelion being blown. And I found it so beautiful on so many levels because it reminded me one of how Alzheimer's and dementia, you know, little bits and pieces, they just kind of get blown away right. of, of the person. But then I realized every single one of those little pieces has a seed of hope and a, a seed of a lesson, a life lesson um, that it's sending out to the world. And I thought, oh, that's so beautiful. Right, right. I saw it. Um, I, I, some people might see in a field of dandelions, especially with its, if it's a field of white poof balls or blow balls, whatever you want to call them, they might see it a field of weeds, but I see a field of wishes. And so, um, just like you say, it's the hope, it's the wish. And it just struck a chord for me. Thank you. Yeah, very, very beautiful. What are some of the lessons that you learned on this journey with your dad? Um, I learned a tenderness um, that I, I, I think I'm a tender person generally, but I really learned more of a tenderness and I tried to see things as he saw them in order to validate him. Um, I think anytime you um, argue with them or say something isn't true or whatever, they're put back. And so it was like I needed to learn that wherever he was, I needed to join him there um, and not look at him as who he was, but who he is. I had to learn how to live in that moment. And I wasn't I wasn't any longer creating memories for him. I was creating moments. And if I left the room, those moments may totally escape him. But at the same time, I gave him those moments, you know, and I could see the love in his eyes and the warmth in his eyes. And anybody who was in that room and they're overhearing a conversation, you can see their eyes following you too, and, um, and the connection that they have with you. Beautiful yeah. that you focused on the moments, not the memories, because I think so many people get so, you know, they've been told that this is a memory disease, and, and they get so looped into that, and the beauty of, of creating those moments, those can be memories for you, but the importance is the here and now for them. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And they might not, um, they might not remember what story you're telling them or reminding them of, but they know how you're making them feel. That they know. You know, they can feel what you're, if you're telling them something um, out of love or if you're telling them something out of, you're chastising them. They feel it. They might not remember the words, but they feel it. And um, yeah, so. How did, how did you learn that? I think I learned it by just being there. I was visiting them three times a week and over an hour each time. And like, I remember one time I had a skull on my face. I must have been thinking about something else. <laughs> And he saw the skull on my face and he immediately felt it was something he said. And he said something like, I, I try, I'm trying to pull it back. Like, you know, I'm trying to take my words back. And I realized he was taking responsibility for that. And so I knew I just needed to um, always be in the moment with him take my shoes off of whatever was going on in my life and leave them outside the door when I stepped into that unit because this was a different world. 
And this was a beautiful world, actually. Um, it, uh, it, it makes me want to cry, really, because it was such a simple, pure world. And um, sometimes, you know, you get so caught up in those stories with the people there and talking with them or relating to them or laughing with them. We had so many good laughs that you just, when I left, it would almost be harder to transition back into the real world <laughs> than it was to transition back into, the, you know, initially into their world. Oh, I agree with you. Is this something you learned immediately or did it take you a year to kind of figure this out? Everyone always asks me about timing and, you know, and I don't really, I dealt with it for 30 years and I don't necessarily have those aha moments of every time I learn something, um, unless I could tie a story or something to it that would, you know, that was really impactful. But people would ask me all the time, you know, you don't, you don't have this doom and gloom, you know, you seem hopeful. Where'd that come from? And it's like, I can't put a date on it, but I know some people can. So how about you? Well, um, I think in the beginning, I was stuck in my own pain of feeling like I lost him. And I really had to focus on this is him now. Think of it in the moment. Um, someone had told me a story a long time ago that um, when I was going through some other hardships, that when we go through trouble in our life, life is like a crib mobile. And all the different factors in your life are all the various pieces hanging from the strings. And if one of those pieces go awry, like if you pull one string on the crib mobile, like all of a sudden that's your dad who's in the Alzheimer's unit and you pull that string, all the other strings, all the other players are trying to find their position in how to relate in this new world, in this new day. This is the new day. And um, that has always been a part of me. I carry that with me wherever I go. Um, if there's something that's upsetting, um, try to realize this is a jerked piece and I just need to figure out my balance. And um, I think it's kind of a heart thing because when you're talking with someone and, and things are out of whack, if you don't feel a piece you know, a sense of peace inside of you, then you know you're not responding in a loving way. And it's a matter of trying to get in touch with, if you're feeling peaceful, if you're feeling calm, you can see that they feel the same way by their eyes. And you know, that's one thing I've learned with this pandemic even, um, with having to wear face masks. We have to communicate with our eyes. You know, we no longer see smiles. We see eyes. And um, in fact, as I was going through my journey with my dad, he forgot the word smile. So he would always say every time I came to visit him, oh, I love your teeth. You have such a nice set of teeth, <laughs> you know? And, and towards the end, when I thought maybe he wasn't recognizing me anymore, I show him my teeth, you know, it's me, <laughs> you know, and hope that he would have some recognition there. But back to the face mask, we don't have that. We have to communicate it with our eyes. And I think um, there's a, even a deeper feeling of love that can be transferred through the eyes um, and we just need to share that. Oh, I so agree with you. And we don't pay, most people don't pay that much attention um, in terms of truly consciously caring. And, and I think that that is critical. I call something um, the hybrid CAR e-giver. And CAR stands for Conscious Awakening of Relationships Getting Off Being Task Oriented and Really Being Focused on Your Relationship. And the e-giver is about the emotional giving, looking for those emotional signs of comfort, 
you know, are they safe? Are they happy? Are they pain free? And you seem to have nailed that um, just wonderfully on your journey. It was a it was a beautiful journey. Was it what I had hoped or even anticipated having in my life? Um, no, I don't think any of us anticipate that. But um, after, you know, the horror of it initially, his was an abrupt drop into Alzheimer's. He had dementia, and then he had to have hip surgery. And when he came out of hip surgery, he, he was gone. He was not the man that went in for the hip surgery. And I think general and anesthesia, sometimes depending on what kind you have, will strike a new level, a new normal for the patient. And he had just dropped levels. And after I got over that shock, I just, it was, it turned out to be a beautiful time. Um, I would, it, it was bittersweet. It was bittersweet, I'd have to say, the whole journey in the memory care unit. Because not only, I mean, one of the things I was thinking about calling my book was linking arms with dandelions. Because they're all different dandelions. And I kind of like that idea of dandelions. And um, it's just a, a world of magic in that memory care unit. If you allow yourself, and that is the main thing I really like um, to stress to people, you know, we've had, we've had this pandemic where um, we've been isolated, we've been quarantined, we know what it's like not to see people. And I think a lot of these um, uh, memory care residents um, have been put there and that's how they feel. If they don't have the visitors, that's how they feel, isolated and alone. And so in the beginning, I was thinking, you know, I just need to promote people to go see their loved ones or connect with them. And then this whole thing came out with the pandemic. And I thought, you know what, though? As a society, we've learned how to be creative, what to do in order to connect with people. And I've seen... I have friends who have, um, and I've seen on the news, uh, a little boy who was um, underneath his grandma's window and would regularly be playing his violin for her. Or um, I had another friend who had a blanket made that has the whole um, family imprinted on the blanket so grandma can feel like she's being hugged by the family. So there are creative ways and we just need to come up with them. And, and we've done a wonderful job and learned how to do a wonderful job in the last four months. We just need to know how to extend that into um, our visits with our loved ones. I agree. I want to talk to you a little bit about those visits. And, and I'm, I also want to say I'm glad you brought up about the anesthesia because some people don't understand the risks of surgery. Um, before they go in and it is something that needs to be discussed with people and so you might have a loved one who hasn't been formally diagnosed but you're seeing signs you need to talk about that I would say that's definitely true first of all I think you know it's a little confusing in the beginning to know are we really seeing signs of all you know of dementia are we really seeing those signs or are they just getting old, you know? Um, and, and maybe we're in denial a little bit or whatever. But if you have any suspicion at all, and if a surgery is going to be um, recommended, find out what the um, um, side effects might be. Because I wasn't made aware of that. And I remember I couldn't stop crying. And I, 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 I'm standing there right in front of my dad, and I didn't want him to know that I was crying and, and him wondering why. And so I, you know, would turn my back so that he couldn't see the tears. I couldn't stop. I mean, I'm like mopping the tears off my face because it was just such a shock. So I think it's um, prudent that we just 
find out what those side effects are going to be and then prepare ourselves for yeah. what might come of it. And I don't think the doctors are overly educated on this. And so that's why they, it's not necessarily discussed or even the anesthesiologist might not know the depths of, of what's going on. And so as family members, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be a huge advocate on that. Now, um, I know so many people have a tough time going to visit. And I, I remember for myself, Monica, I actually found I had two types of friends. Both asked me how my mom was doing. And one asked me because they really wanted to know. And the other one wanted to give me permission to not have to go see her because she didn't remember me. Because they didn't know how to deal with me dealing with dementia. Right. So the easiest way would be to cut the losses. You know, if I give her permission not to go, then I don't have to hear about it because she's not going to tell me about it. And, and when I realized that, I was shocked because I would never not go. I mean, that's just not the relationship I have or who I am at my right. core. And I, I guess I didn't overly struggle going on visit. There were times, you know, when there were big changes that were difficult. But overall, I didn't find it difficult. My two brothers did, though. How did, how did you deal with that? And did you have other family um, that was, you know, supporting your dad as well? I have a brother and he also went to visit my dad. We didn't go in together, so I don't know how he really handled it. There was a shop owner at Von Hansen's Meat Market and my dad would make regular trips to go get his two hot dogs every night that he would have for dinner before he went into the memory care unit. So this guy said he'd like to go visit my dad. So I welcomed him to come and visit him and he could not contain himself. He started weeping and had to leave the room. Now I think it's, it's what the struggle is, is if you can't, um, if, you're struck, if you're stuck in your own pain of feeling the loss, then you're gonna, continually be stuck in that pain until you can get past it. You're going to be devastated because you can see it as a loss, but you can also see it. And I know um, people with Alzheimer's, they're all kinds of personalities. My dad was a sweet, sweet man. And, but we had others in the, in, the, in the care unit that were more aggressive or angry or whatever. And you just have to deal with them the way they are. Take yourself. I didn't know them from what they were before. I only knew what they were now. And that's how I had to view my dad. Pretend like I didn't know before. This is who he is now. How can I talk to this man now? You know, and maybe I could use a word like he retired from Ford Motor Company. If I maybe threw in Ford, maybe a light would go on and maybe there'd be some kind of communication that he could feel like he's participating. Because I think that's one thing they feel like the conversation is going on around them, but they're not in it. And if you can give them a spark so that they can light on it and feel like they contribute. I mean, I almost could see my dad puff out his chest like he's in this. And I really believe that these Alzheimer, the people with Alzheimer's, they know that they don't know. My dad would say, what's up here doesn't come down so it can come out. And that was the most heart-wrenching thing was to know that he knew. Um, so if I could give him reassurances that I'm right on the page with him and maybe he's speaking complete no or, uh, nonsense, I understand and reassure him that I understand, even if I didn't, you know, and really towards the end, it didn't matter if I understood or not. Because all that mattered is that we were communicating. He was happy. I could see the glow on his face. Um, it's just a, a love communication. And so, yes, I mean, it, I think your initial question was, was it hard to go visit him or whatever? I'm kind of spinning this around. It was hard at first, 
but it became beautiful. And um, you just need to learn how to spin it. Um, things that start devastating you, you, you kind of have to reach deep behind what you hear or see and step out of outside of your own and be there with them. I don't know how quite to explain it, but no, that makes that makes sense to me and I think it'll make sense to a lot of people listening as well and for those that don't get it next time they visit they'll look at things different and it might click you know or it might take a couple of times but you know I found you know for myself um and this people think that this might sound really strange I suppose but I found going to visit my mom was the safest place in the world to go because she didn't judge she didn't judge me at all on any level. Right. And she was past her ego. It, none of that stuff mattered. It was all about being peaceful and joyful. And there was this calmness of, you know, not having to pretend, not having to explain yourself, but just know you were accepted. And I thought, wow, what a gift she's giving me and what a gift we can give back to them mm -hmm. in, in just being gracious and and to me it taught me different levels of unconditional love right in the process that I didn't even know existed I mean I thought you know I got married and you know I love my husband I had a kid you know you hear about unconditional love but there are these levels of unconditional love that to me become this spiritual journey a, a, a higher awakening and knowing and, and an ability to communicate on levels that I guess I didn't really know existed. I wasn't conscious of them. I mean, mm -hmm. I've always known to look for nonverbals and I've always been pretty good at that since I've been a little kid, um, but it took it to new heights. And when you don't even have to say a word, like one of the things I tell people is, you know, one of the safest places for I think most people is to be just sitting next to somebody they love. They, they don't have to even touch, they don't have to, they don't have to talk, but you just feel this, this sense of serenity. And I think, I really think dementia is here to teach us that this is available to all of us anytime. And you don't have to wait until somebody it's sick. I agree with you that it's a very safe place to be and it's a very pure place to be and I did feel you know at first I felt I was coming for him but as time went on I was coming for me you know because um, I received so much out of those visits that when he passed and I was no longer able to go and see him, um, I, there was an empty hole. And it wasn't just the hole of him being gone. It was the whole of the whole experience, the loss of the whole experience. And it, and it takes practice to get to that point. I mean, I don't think you can just go to the memory care start unit and start visiting with your loved one and expect that right away. It's a nurturing. It's a nurturing of your loved one. It's a nurturing of the other residents within that community and letting go of yourself and letting what is there in. You know, let go of all this other stuff, let go of your ego, let go of everything and just be. I wouldn't give those three years up for anything. Despite the circumstances, those were um, real blessings for me. Yeah, that's how I feel about the 30 year journey with my mom as well. You know, and I've had discussions with people on right to die and we've done like two hour specials and we've had the doctors and we've had uh, people diagnosed and their care partners, all kinds of people talk about this topic. And I remember at the end, they, they asked me, well, Lori, what do you think? And I said, I'm a girl who likes all my options, so I want the right to die. I'm not saying I'm gonna use them, but I'll, I'm just a girl who likes her options. And I said, but I can tell you I wouldn't have given up one second, not one. Mm -hmm. And people were shocked and I'm like, just because you, you want a right doesn't mean 
doesn't mean you're going to use it. And, you know, if I get it, what will I do? I, you know, the, the powerful lessons that are taught during this process or, or can be taught, can be learned if you choose, like you said, to open up those doors. I mean, it, it's miracle level stuff. I mean, it's, it's like changing. And it's so um, beautiful and grounding and, you know, lets you know that you don't have to be perfect. Life isn't perfect. I mean, it, it kind of kicks perfection to the curb right. all together. And, um, you know, my mom taught me how to play again. You know, like you said, live in their world, let go, just have fun. Because as adults, we get real serious. We're real good at that as, you know, when we're children. And, and that's a, I saw a side of my mom I never would have seen if she wouldn't have gotten sick. Yeah. I, I, I saw this innocence and this beauty and, you know, her coloring with my, my five-year-old daughter at the time, who you couldn't tell who was more proud of their pictures. <laughs> How fun was that? And, the, and, you know, my daughter only knew my, my mom her grandma with dementia and they had a connection that was uncomparable to yeah. anything. They brought in um, uh, the care center where my dad was. They had um, a little, I don't know, not a nursery, but some, some little side thing that was connected to the building and they bring the little kids in. And the, like, when you'd see the little kids with the older um, dementia patients, it was beautiful. Um, but as speaking as far as other sides, my dad was a blue collar worker and very just nuts and bolts about him. And when he was in the memory care unit, uh, I stress this even in my book, is his words became poetic. Like I'll give an example. Um, he would say, this is a whole different side of him. And it wasn't intentional. He just didn't have the boundaries anymore. And he'd say, I'd say, how's the salad, dad? And he would say, no, it doesn't have any freedom. And I thought, what does he mean by it doesn't have any freedom? And I, you know, I started to decode some of the things that he was saying. And what I think he was saying is it's just a plain old salad. There's nothing special about it. There's nothing that makes it unique. It's just a salad. So it doesn't have any freedom. And so, I mean, I, that's what I started to do is just take down notes of the different things that he said and use them. I, I made three journals full of notes. And that's what I used for my book as far as um, taking us into the world of a memory care unit. So Monica, one of the things I want to ask you is, and I'm sure you've heard this probably from friends thinking, oh, this has to be so depressing. I feel so sorry for you. And, you know, it's got to be just such this doom and gloom journey. What do you, what do you say to those people? Because I can tell that wasn't your path. It wasn't at all. It was um, something we looked forward to. We had designated days. We knew we were going to come on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. And um, just so we kind of looked to see when other people were coming so that he would have visitors kind of spread out a little bit. And I would look forward to those times. There, weren't, there wouldn't be anything that would take the place of that. If something else came up, I would say, no, I'm seeing my dad that day, you know? And it was a day brightener. I mean, it was my purpose. It was my purpose to go and spend that time with him. Um, like I said earlier, not only was my visit important for him, it was important for me. You know, I saw a whole different side of my dad. I saw a whole different side of humanity, um, just in that little community with the people that reside there. Yeah, I, I just think it's so important for, for people to hear this other side. You know, and, and, <laughs> and so, so many are, I think people who haven't been on the journey are surprised, but so many who are on the journey go, 
oh, you too, because they're still dealing with that battle of people think this is supposed to be horrible. And not, not that you'd wish this on anybody, don't get me wrong there, but it truly can be a, a gift. Anyways, I, that's what I call it. Uh, it was a gift and it was humor. I mean, there was this one feisty 93-year-old that was in the memory care unit and all of a sudden she would go, and then another table would go, and then she'd start it again. And pretty soon the whole room was doing shave and a haircut, two bits, you know? And we were all laughing. My husband and I, we were joining right in, you know? And then all of a sudden staff was trying to get things settled down for the meal. So they go, okay, now, okay, <laughs> you know? But it was good humor. There was a lot of good humor. And it's not just, it's not doom and gloom. It's not just beautiful. There are funny moments. Um, it's just, it's special. Yeah. It's just special. Yeah, I know uh, when I would go, I would say I would experience the whole range of emotions. I mean, I remember times where I was just doing the crocodile tears. Um, other times I couldn't stop from laughing. You know, other times you're, you might be consoling somebody or just sitting peacefully. One of the things that you did that I hear some people do, but I, I'd like to hear more people do this, but is to really take on that, what I call family by choice mode, where they all became part of the family. You know, the, the staff and the residents alike, everybody, you know, just becomes a whole. And, and I found part of my role in caring for my mom was to kind of lead by example. And, and leading by example showed other families how maybe they could interact when they were feeling really uncomfortable right. or asking to join us if they'd like, or um, even teaching staff maybe how to feed my mom in a different way so that they would feed other people in a different way or ask for you know, the music to be turned down because it's just a little bit too loud, you know, if you're right. trying to have them calm and things. And, and so there's so many roles that you can play in this process. I never thought of that before, that um, a person is kind of teaching by example. But I think you're definitely right there because I remember um, a new patient coming in or a new resident coming in and her two daughters were with her and they were crying and you know it was devastating and it reminded me of when we first brought my dad in um, we weren't necessarily crying but we probably were but um, <laughs> but um, I, I reassured them you know I was like the promoter for the um, care unit I said they're gonna love it here I said really your mom is just going to love it. I said, if it comes right down to it, I would love it because, because you're with other people and you're not just sitting in your home um, with an occasional visitor. You can, if you don't feel like doing anything, they can sit and look, they can watch, they can hear. Their senses are all stimulated. Whereas I think in a home situation where you're trying to um, help them so that they can stay in their home. It's not necessarily the best thing. It could be, but at that point, my dad didn't even know he had a home. You know, he, he lost that word. He didn't understand that. So, uh, well, and they say, you know, when people say, I want to go home, home isn't a sticks and bricks, home is a feeling. So he didn't have to go home because he had that sense of home. Right. You know? And he would say, I love my life. And I'm like, it was like music. He loves his life. You know, after he'd been robbed of his life, he still loved his life, which told me that he still had the heart connection. He still had and felt the love that was, you know, around him. So... And what more can you want for somebody? That's right. Really? Yeah. You know, it's exactly. I, I, sometimes we, again, I think we focus way too much on the list of things to do and the tasks. 
instead of how we're making them feel. Right. And, you know, we all want to be felt welcomed and loved and purposeful and connected. And, and it's really an easy thing to do if, when we finally get out of our own way. That's right. And we are in our way, even if, even if, even unrelated to a memory care unit, we're kind of in our way as we muddle our way through life, you know, we kind of get in our own way. So oh, I, I agree. What, what was your inspiration to write the book? Well, Lori, I'll tell you, um, I really never saw myself as a writer. Um, I, I hear interesting things. I write them down because they just kind of tickled my ear or whatever. But what really happened was um, I had fallen asleep. It was nighttime. I was dreaming. And I heard this loud voice saying, your assignment is to write. And I woke up and my whole being knew that it was God telling me it was my assignment. This is my assignment. I mean, I, it, I had no doubt on it. So I kind of got back to it and I thought, okay, yeah, I will. And then I didn't. And then I, it happened three times. The second time um, I'm in school, my dream, I'm in school and I'm not turning in my homework and teachers are getting upset with me. And finally one teacher says, you're not doing your assignment. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, he's really holding me accountable here. And so then another time I was trying to, um, uh, merge my two stories and I thought I don't know how to do this and the voice said I will guide you and I, and he did you know so I really wasn't my aspiration to write um, I felt um, that I was like I said earlier a vessel he wanted me to write this book he wants me to touch people I'm hoping that's exactly what I'm doing well, that's a neat story. I, I too have been talked to at that level. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. And I was basically told, because I, I have a couple of books in me too. And I've, I've piddled with them once, once pretty much ready to go. And, and the other one, I, just accumulation of things. But the priority for me was to get communications done differently change the culture of care in, you know, around the world with dementia and, um, and to get people talking, to, to ease the conversation. Right. And so that's why I started the blog and the radio show and do dementia chats and, um, you know, the speaking and training I do and, and the, the books are there and they'll come, but the priority was to, to get people to connect because we weren't doing that. Um, right. You know, I, I've only been doing this, what, 10, 11 years now. And, uh, you know, there, there were no radio shows. There, there were no videos of people with dementia actually talking about what's going on. Everything was very direct in education, and this is the right way to do it. But it wasn't experience-based. And, you know, I'm all... I'm all for best practices, even though I hate that term, because to me it's so clinical, because I think some of the best practices we still haven't heard about because they're in somebody else's house and they haven't shared them yet. Well, I think, you know, people didn't talk about it much because you didn't want to admit that somebody in your family had dementia, you know? I mean, it was kind of, I think, almost hush-hush. Um, people didn't talk about it, or they just... They, thought it was going, I don't know if it's going senile or <laughs> my dad always feared going senile. I mean, that was his, his fear. So I, um, I, I applaud all your efforts that you've made and what you do for the families of um, any of these dementia uh, people, people with dementia or Alzheimer's because they need to know that there is a network that of others and they're caring people and loving people and it's all um it all can be beautiful it doesn't have to be heart-wrenching it can be heartwarming well thank you um it was funny when you said others I, I, in my mind i it 
I twisted that to be like aliens. And then I thought, well, that's kind of how we all feel. We just <laughs> feel like we're really strange out there and nobody else gets this. And then when you connect with this network of people, again, the, the burdens just roll off. You can be your authentic self. You can cry. You can be angry because because they understand. That's right. And, and they might not be able to fix your situation. They may have some great advice, but they will always support you. And you don't feel alone. Yeah. You know? Huge, huge difference. What advice would you give to somebody just beginning the journey? I would say always agree because but whatever they say, they believe it. So if you argue, if you know, if they said, well, you haven't visited me for, if, for a year, you say, I know that, but you know what? I am going to make a better habit of this. Even if you were there just yesterday, because you're never going to be able to convince them of reality. Their reality is their reality. So to keep peace with the whole situation, just agree um, to always keep a smile handy. Uh, like, I, like I said earlier, my dad equated me with my teeth. <laughs> it was just, oh, your teeth, how do you keep them so nice in a row? You know, I mean, it was like, well, <laughs> you know. So, and then I think they need appreciation because I think everyone feels, um, everyone craves to be feeling like they're valued and when you get older even if you don't have dementia or Alzheimer's you want to feel, feel that value and I think it's important to express that to them how important they are and how they were such a steadfast person in your growing up years and how they could fix anything and remember how you used to fix my bike and remember how you used to fix mom's clothes dryer even if she didn't want it fixed she wanted a new clothes dryer you know just kind of always stroke them and um, be upbeat and chipper even if you have to fake it so that they're not thinking they're responsible for you being down. Um, yeah, that's basically a show love and show it deeply. Yeah. Show love and kindness. I love that, you know, agree with them. There's a, the improv is always yes, but, and the, but is about if you need to transition them off of something, you know, try to transition them towards something else. So, if somebody's angry or sad, you, you need to validate what it is they're going through. And, and I love the smile because, you know, the old saying we used to say to our kids, smile can turn a frown upside down, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, it's so true. Um, and then the appreciation. One of the things that I did kind of as an experiment, which was really interesting, but it, it really, put that point home of how important being validated and appreciated was, was I took out my camera and I asked people if I could take pictures of them. And there would be people that would be, you know, sleeping, non-responsive, that's typically who they were. And their heads would come up and their eyes would open and they get these smiles on their face. And I'd say cheese. And it didn't make any difference if I had film in the camera, if it was, you know, before, before right. you had your phones and all of that <laughs> yeah. stuff. They knew they were important enough for someone to take the time to look at them and want to capture them. And I just got so emotional doing that because it was like, it was like all these little cocoons opened up. Right. And it was so beautiful. And it's like, what a simple thing that all of us could do at, at really any age, even a, a little one at three now knows how to take a picture with a phone, <laughs> you know, but that, that mere interaction or, 
you know, maybe it's rubbing lotion on somebody's hands, just taking that time for touch, or if it's a woman doing her nails or doing somebody's hair, but that tactile touch, I think is something that we lose as, as we age as well. And those are real little things that can be added to show appreciation. So, um, gosh, I just, I, I could talk with you all day long, Monica. This has been lovely. Thank you. I, I love your insights. Now you have a book launch that's coming up. Um, Wednesday, August 26th, and that's going to be at Winchester and Rye in Victoria. And you're doing two of launches, one at 3.30 and one at 5.30, but people need to make a reservation because seating is going to be limited there. And the number is 952-856-1540. And if you can make it, I would highly encourage you to do so. And to purchase Monica's book, it's available on Amazon and also Barnes and Noble. We've got both those links for you there. And you can always, of course, go to her site. Monica Beerling Hall. And that's Monica, V as in Victor, dot com. Okay, and then I'll let you say your email address as well. My email is M, V as in Victor, I E R L I N G H A L L at Comcast.net. And Wonderful. I would be honored to hear from anybody, and I would love to see anybody who would like to come to the launch and celebrate with me. I'm real excited. Well, I'm going to see if I can make it out there. Um, I, I haven't checked my schedule yet, but I oh, um, I would love to meet you in person. I would love that. That would be that would be fun. I would imagine they'll have social distancing in place. They have all the state regulations. Everything it will be adhered to. And so um, I'm imagining at that they could get a signed copy from you then. Exactly. I would love that. And again, the name of the book is called I, I just love that title. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you for taking the time, not only to be with us, but the time to capture the story and to give hope and love and laughter. Um, what, a, what a gift. What a gift you've given to the world, Monica. Thank you. Blessings to you. Thank you so much, Lori. Thank you. And to our audience, like, click, and share this and pass it along. I'm telling you, people aren't going to be disappointed. Till next time, bye-bye.